as always, I'm super excited uh, to be here and super excited to be with anybody who's uh, logging on today. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, as we've all been reflecting a little bit um, on what's important to us and how we got where we are and what's important, of course, you know, Panky, I started Panky, it was has to be almost, I guess, 18 years ago now, somewhere around there, 17, 18. And, you know, it certainly, <clears throat> I would say it definitely changed my life, obviously. Um, in fact, there are a couple of people like, for instance, uh, Margie Mannering, who was uh, one of my visiting faculty, and she's still one of my best friends and mentors today. Uh, Glenn Joyce, uh, one of my best friends in the whole world that I met um, at Panky as well. We actually still communicate and do some education together. In fact, we're having a happy hour, a virtual happy hour tonight. I hope everybody's having virtual happy hours um, right now. Um, we, I, I, I wasn't sure I would was going to divulge this, but I, I think I should. You should know that Kimberly, my girlfriend, and I are on um, day 18 of happy hours. Um, I don't think it's going to be able to continue until the end of the virus. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of happy hours, but, um, but, but we're, we're, we're trying to make the best of it. But anyway, so Panky has been a big part of, of uh, who I am, and, and it makes me think about what's important to me, and giving back to Panky is very important to me, and being part of this community is really important to me. So, so thanks for having me. Uh, today. Uh, what we're going to talk about is, you know, during uh, this time when, when the whole dental community is forced to be at home, um, different from a lot of um, professions right now, we're really forced to be at home. So what, what can we be doing? Well, <laughs> there's certainly uh, no shortage of online education right now, this included. And, um, but the good news is there is so much right now, and a lot of us are on information overload. And so I thought, well, you know, what could I contribute? And what maybe what do they want me to contribute? And what can we work on while we're at home and not feel the information overload, but also give ourselves something um, tangible to do as opposed to just watching and listening? What could I actually work on? What could I, what could I spend an hour on Monday and an hour on Wednesday sort of sitting at my desk and doing? And that's what I thought about. And, and we can certainly identify and refine your, what I would call your core systems. Now there's many, we can call systems in the dental office, many. Almost I would say limitless if we wanted to say um, of different, as I call them, point A to point B in the office that we can define and refine and create optimal around. But there are some core systems that I would say, if we just focus on those, just those alone, and really put some intention to those, that would probably be um, a, a decent running dental practice, something that has a foundation that we can come back and refine a little bit. Now, I thought today um, I would start by showing this pyramid. And the reason I thought it would be nice to show this pyramid today is it comes from way back. It's, it's evolved over time. Um, and um, somebody who was one of their early cadre at Panky, uh, Mike Schuster, um, I really started a lot of what you're going to see today, and it has evolved through a lot of us. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today um, unless, uh, unless Mike had started this. But then throw in um, Mike's son-in-law, uh, Mark Badiato, who I've done some work with, and Deb Castillo, who I've done some work with. You'll see a lot of the work that we've done together today because we share, we collaborate, we grow. You'll see some things you've heard from Sherry Kay, who's been an influential for a lot of us, including me and a friend. So this certainly isn't my stuff. Um, some of this goes all the way back to my second consultant that I had in my office. His name is Mike Farley, just a guy in Central Oregon that, that helped change my life as well in my practice because he was such a, an amazing, humble coach to me. So of course, I bring that into you as well. And a lot of what you'll see here today actually comes from, interestingly, um, uh, his name is Gary Kyoto. And Gary Kyoto um, is currently, um, ironically, the dean of University of Washington. Of course, I now live in Seattle, and he's the dean here. But he was also the dean at, at OHSU in Oregon when I was uh, running the faculty practice, or I was director of the faculty practice. And he um, supported me in, in um applying for and going through a master's curriculum in healthcare, which has everything to do from leadership, communication, 
to finance, to, um, to systems. I mean, everything. So, so I tend to take all that. And if you're wondering why I'm here today, it, it just, it's just evolved. And so some formal education, et cetera, et cetera. But what, when you look at this pyramid, back to the pyramid, I want you to see that as with any pyramid, you can't really move up a pyramid unless we have a solid base, right? And so we could spend today talking about the business side, or we could talk about, about you being a leader, which is one of my very favorite topics a lot of you know. But we're going to spend a lot of time today is in this part of the pyramid, communication development, because these are really our systems in the practice. We want to talk about systems. So please know that we're, we're touching on a little bit of the practice today that it doesn't really go well unless we have a foundation underneath it. And I'll touch on that a little bit as we, as we come to the end. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring those names into it and, and make sure we're all clear on, on what we're talking about today specifically um, within the practice. And it seems overwhelming. And for a lot of dentists, and a lot of people that are here today know that there's a heck of a lot more in dentistry than just doing dentistry. Our assumption back then, which was, as you see here, is a fatal assumption. Uh, Deb and I talk about this all the time. It's if you understand the technical work of the business, you must understand the business that does the technical work. And we know that's not the case, right? Some of you have read um, Gerber's book, The E-Myth. Um, Gerber says beautifully that, yeah, you can be a great technician. That's part of doing it. That's what most of us are as dentists. But don't forget, we have to look at the business in the future and think about how we want it to be, have some entrepreneurial thoughts and processes around it. And some of us sort of suck at that. Some it comes naturally to. And then don't forget, there's a third part of it, which is managing the business, being the manager, managing people managing processes. So most people are really good at one of them and we need to develop the other. As you know, and this is not a diss on, on any, any dentists out there, but some dentists are spectacular entrepreneurs and maybe their dentistry needs a lot of improvement. Great. And some are amazing managers, the way they interact with people and not so entrepreneurial. But regardless, we want to look at all three of those, right? And there really are three areas of the business that need to be working in harmony, if you will. And to simplify it a little bit, we'll talk about operations, right? If we think about just the way the practice operates. So how's your new patient flow and how do you manage that? How, do you, how are you looking at patient retention, team management, quality control? How's your quality and time management? And it was, a lot of us think that, well, that's dentistry, but don't forget, we also have to make sure we stay going, stay moving. And so there's internal marketing. And for some practices, there's, there's very intentional external marketing that we have to look at very intentionally. And then don't forget, we have to look at the budget. We have to understand the money, financial policies, how we actually, how the money actually comes in, how we set our fees, how are we going to collect the money, and what in the heck are our goals in the first place? So this becomes really important for us to think about. And we wish that all of that together just sort of look like this. This was our dental practice. Man, it's just, it just rolls down the road. Except what we know to be true is, is when we look at the system, we talk about systems thinking because the way our new patients actually come in might impact the way we schedule. Well, the way our new patients come in might impact the way we schedule, might impact the way our recare system is. Well, the way we actually do financial arrangements might impact the way our new patient comes in, might impact the way our recare system is, might impact the way we're going to market the practice, and it might impact the way we're going to flow through the practice. And all of a sudden, you start to realize that the system itself is there are certain systems within the system. So I'm going to play with words for a minute here. This is systems thinking right now. Systems thinking is that we know that one part of the practice always affects the other. You, there are a lot of people out there, and again, don't take this the wrong way, who have um, people come in and say, we're just gonna revamp the hygiene department. It's a, it's a hygiene consultant, if you will. And we're just gonna look at that. Well, we forget though that one change in one part of the practice always impacts every, literally every other part of the practice. So that systems thinking, looking from way up here and saying, wow, if I change that, how is that going to impact everything else? So that's systems thinking. And then we're going to talk about systems in and of themselves, which is different because a system within the practice 
is really, as you see there, it is for me, it's a, it's a boring word. A lot of you that are on the, uh, the call today or the Zoom, you know that I think that's one of the most boring words out there. And you're like, oh, I'm going to spend a whole time off while we're stuck at home with COVID doing my systems. Oh, that sounds flipping awesome. Um, no, it sounds boring as heck. But when we really think about it, what is a system? A system is how energy and information flows through the office. And now, now you've got my energy a little bit more because I do want to think about how energy and information flows through the office. And I'm going to say it's a guideline because there's another word with systems that we really talk a lot about today. And that is system sensing. So there's systems thinking and then there's creating systems and then there's system sensing. I do a lot of work with this, um, well, with a lot of people, but system sensing is within the day-to-day -day practice. It's a type of leadership. How, do, how, do we, how can we be agile and how do we help our team be agile? So, so system sensing is more about leadership that we're not gonna get into today. But regardless, that's why these are just guidelines because we have to be agile, flexible with we have a while we have a foundation. So here's what happens a lot. We have an experience in our office and we say, well, that experience, especially if you just went into a practice as an associate or bought an existing practice and you said, ah, I have an experience. Therefore, that's the system. And therefore, that is my expectation when I walk in the office every day. So basically, you have an experience and then that's your expectation. My hope for all of us, for every dental practice, is that we actually think ahead of time. What do we want to happen? What is our expectation? What does optimal look like for us? And now let's very intentionally create a system around that. And then when we do that, we, that will be our experience. And it's that middle bar there creating that system with intention so that we have the experience that takes some work. But when we put the work into it, it looks like this. We have an expectation and that is the experience we have. So what are what I consider the core seven systems that make up sort of the things that I think we could, of course, there's a bucket load more. So, you know, we have 45, 50 minutes of time together today. So please remember that these are what I would call the critical systems that we should at least look at and think about with some intention. And I listed them in, um, in, in an order because I thought it would be great to talk about today, just sort of the flow. And then I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, this is the perfect mnemonic. It's PUMFKITTB. And I thought, everybody's going to remember this now. The seven critical systems are PUMFKITTB. And so now you know it. You'll never forget it with this great mnemonic. Um, so let's start with the first one, P. Um, and that is the, the patient handoff. Now, again, when we talk about a patient handoff, um, what do I mean by patient handoff? Well, it can be anything in your office. But really what I want you to think about, and this is why I bring it up first, because we talked about how energy and information flows through the office. Well, how do you want energy and information to flow through your office? From, as we move the patient, maybe it's from the front desk back to hygiene, and then how do we transfer that information to the dentist when the dentist walks in for the hygiene exam? And then that information, we might want to, we might want to make sure we have the updated information back to the hygienist that the dentist added to it. But then the hygienist needs to bring all this information back to the front desk. That's one possibility of a patient handoff. You could create a patient handoff that is literally just from the time that the patient walks in to the time they go back to the back with the dental assistant. Um, but it is how do you want, what energy do you need? What information is actually critical? You see, I don't wanna guess what my front office needs. I don't wanna guess what my um, hygienist needs. My hygienist does not wanna guess what I need, but we do it all the time. And we hope that we made the right choice. But if we know what optimal is, if we know that the temperature should be 98.6 degrees, and we know what that looks like, well, when all of a sudden it gets to 99, we're like, that's not optimal because we know what optimal looks like. So for me, a, any patient handoff is, what does optimal look like? And I'll tell you a quick story um, right now. Let me have a sip of tea real quick. In my office when I was, and I'll tell you a real quick personal story. Um, in my office when we were going over systems like this back in the early 2000s, 
there was a time when we were having team meetings that we're going to talk about, but I want to share the story with you now. So we were having um, team meetings on a regular basis, and then with an agenda that we'll talk about in a little bit. And um, Cindy, my front office person, says, hey, is it okay if we talk about what's happening when the patients come out of hygiene in our team meeting? I don't think, I, I think it could be more optimal. And I said, this is beautiful. This is what we've been talking about. And so I said, let's put it on the agenda so everybody knows that it's going to be how the patients are coming from hygiene up to you. That could be our point A to point B. She goes, beautiful, Kev. So, um, so it's, it's time for our team meeting. And so I said, well, you, and we're to that point in the agenda. And I say, so Cindy asked this month if we could talk about front, the way the patient comes from hygiene up to the front office. I said, Cindy, so let's talk about that a little bit. And Cindy goes, yeah, I got to tell you, I feel like um, I wish I had some warning because sometimes I'm on the phone and there's a patient coming in and then all of a sudden, bam, the patient is there from hygiene. And I wished I would have had a little warning. And I said to Michelle, my hygienist, yeah, Michelle, give Cindy some warning, you know, help her out here. We're, we're trying to develop these systems. And, and Michelle goes, oh yeah, yeah, okay, for sure. And Cindy goes, well, one other thing. She goes, I, I would love it. Like sometimes I don't have all the information I need for what I'm scheduling. And I feel like it could be given to me a little better. And I go, yeah, Michelle, I said, yeah, Michelle, give Cindy the information that she needs to schedule these patients a little bit better. And, and, and Cindy goes, yeah, there's one more thing. Like, like sometimes even the patient doesn't know what you talked about. It could be some clear. I'm like, wow, there's a lot going on here, you know? And uh, so I'm like, yeah, you guys, you got to help Cindy have what she needs. And Michelle, my hygienist goes, well, Kev, you know, I would have all the information for Cindy and we would all be clear if you wouldn't just get done with your exam and push the auto eject button and out the door down to your next patient. And I go, yeah, you, oh. so what you're saying is, and they're like, yeah, what we're saying is we can't have all this information downstream because you aren't giving it to us. You, you, you think you've got it, you think we've got it and out the door you go. So really, so I want you to see here for the patient handoff, here's sort of the flow. And we're going to go over this a little bit, but and this was my office, so please, you know, don't, this is not you at all. But we had to start a point A. So our point A was that in the operatory that we had the referral, if there was a referral to a specialist filled out, and the presenter, if you're a Dentrix person, um, was filled out. We had to pick a point A, a, a starting place. And then we wanted, our point B was when the patient got to the front. And what does that look like? What is optimal? What does 98.6 degrees look like so that we're not guessing what everybody needs. And you can sort of see down this little flow chart and we'll talk about flow charts in a little bit, but, but basically it's like, hey, Kevin, why don't you ask the assistant or the hygienist that's in the room, whoever's in the room, if they have any questions before you leave? And I'm like, oh, you just need me to ask the question, yeah. And then we pop up Cindy and say, we'll probably be up in five minutes and Cindy's like, this is great. And then Kevin, you get your butt out of there because we're done with you, I go, great. But then we're going to ask the patient. Cindy goes, you could ask the patient, do you have any questions before we go see Cindy? And then you could debrief the patient if you're following down there. And then it's like, yeah, Cindy's like, yeah, now bring them to me. And now it's to Cindy. But Cindy goes, but could you please just verbalize what was done for the day and the next appointment, et cetera. And then we finished our, our sort of decision tree there. But we had to pick a point A to a point B. And this is what we do with teams all the time. If you want to have a flow chart like that, it can get a little bit messy. Um, so what we want to do is maybe start, I do this with teams all the time. It's like a sticky, you, you start with a point A, you know, hygienist gives, um, gives Dr. Um, red polishing or something like that, because that's what it is. You had to pick a point A and then get all the way to the point B. And when we get some clarity through it, because we're going to move stickies, we're going to throw them out. And then we can turn that into a nice little word document if you want, where now we've got something to reflect back on. So you can either create this while you're out of the office or you can refine it while you're out of the office. Think it through and think, is that optimal for me right now? Do I have a vision of what optimal looks like? Because every office is different. This is a different office that you see right here. This is their flow for what's optimal with them. Everything from the time the doctor walks in to how we're transferring the information from the hygienist to the doctor for the doctor's information back to the hygienist so that the hygienist can refer it back to the patient. And then we can all go to hygiene. What energy and information do we want transferred from person to person? And what does that look like ideally? And I would be remiss right now if I didn't say that this is a perfect time to talk about what this looks like because it isn't all about the doctor, is it? 
because that would be very self-centered. And what you see here from this diagram is that everybody in the office has their own needs and challenges and objectives. But sometimes we don't all know what those are. And even if we put our focus on the business, as you see here, we still all have our own needs and challenges and objectives. But it's more than that, it's more about the business. And some practices feel like it's great, let's put the patient in the middle. And, and now let's all focus on the patient. But yet what you see on the outside of the circle is that we all have our own needs and challenges and objectives, but yet we're all focused into something else. Could you imagine if as we're creating these quote unquote systems or how energy and information flows through the office, that we, we, if we actually said during this process, the doctor said to everybody, you know what, I have my own needs and challenges and objectives, but assistant, what do you need to do your job to the best of your ability? Because now I know that. And hygienist, what do you need? What needs and challenges and objectives do you have to go from point A to point B optimal in the office? And now as we're creating these systems, we actually are, it's a different kind of a leadership in the practice. And the Arbinger Institute wrote a book, it's called a Leadership and Self-Deception. They sort of took, um, it, it's been a lot going on. I mean, it started years ago in the, in the mid 1990s with a guy by the name of Peter Senge, who started looking at the way systems are as we evolve as a, um, as a society. And, and it, he was brilliant. And I was using Senge stuff back in the late 90s, early 2000s to look at it differently. And the Arbiter Institute took that and put their own twist on it, which is brilliant. And they call it outward mindset. So it's a way that the systems are to where we're always asking each other, what is it that you need to do your job to the best of your ability as we move from this point A to point B? And so you can imagine if we're deciding how the patient handoff is gonna go and what it looks like, now the front office knows what your needs and challenges and objectives are and can ask you, what can I do to help you do your job to the best of your ability? And same thing, the hygienist, as we start to see what optimal looks like, knows what everybody else's needs and challenges and objectives are. We also know what her, his or hers are as well. And it's the same with the assistant, you get the idea. So as we're actually creating these systems, they are actually team-centered systems. We have to know what optimal looks like from point A to point B together as a team. And now, when, as we create that together, we now know what everybody needs to do his or her job to the best of their ability. That's a team-centered system. And what you'll see here, of course, is that what you don't see anywhere listed there is the patient. And I know that scares you quite a bit. Um, I love the patients just as much as you do. We need them. We wouldn't be here. This is very obvious right now because we're all sitting at home. Um, but when we know what optimal looks like, and we know what we all need to do our job to the best of our ability, then guess who has a beautiful experience in your office? Guess who is well taken care of? Of course, it's the patient. Except how do you feel in the office right now? How you feel is a sense of love and appreciation and esteem um, and, and you can be yourself. And so team-centered systems are different. And when we pick, let's just go back to the, the handoff for a minute. Now we're gonna talk about what do we see? How do we know it's working? And we get to come back to numbers don't lie. So if we were to change something in the patient handoff, you would expect to see something change, but you would know what you expected to change in the first place. Is it that, you, that the production changed? It might go up and it might go down because that may have been your intention as we started to change the way information and energy flows through the office. You would expect to see what you wanted to see you might actually expect to see that, that you become more efficient throughout the office. So your gross production per day actually goes up, but it's not because you maybe you're seeing more patients or working more days. It's because the energy and information in the office, the flow is more efficient, we become more efficient, and the numbers reflect that. We're going to talk about numbers a little bit over the next little bit of time here. The second uh, system I wanted to bring up today is the morning huddle. And the reason I put it second right now is because now that we're sort of talking about what optimal looks like, how energy and information flows through the office, well, how do we, how do we stay agile and check in with each other on a regular basis and get back to that system sensing that we talked about, which is, which is be, be nimble, but also have some structure about us. And that is when the morning huddle um, comes into play. For me and for a lot of offices, 
the morning huddle is really about connecting because we are a team. We're team centered now. And for me, one of the most important things is how are we connecting? How are we starting our day with intention? Do we feel like we're touching each other and that our day is filled with love? And that's what, that's what I would hope for for you. But as we do that, the other thing I'm thinking about is, as far as the morning huddle goes, is, is the information presented that we are going to talk about this morning, is it relevant to today? Is it going to impact today? Because if it's not, why are we talking about it right now? And secondly, are we regurgitating the information from the schedule that everybody reads? So many morning huddles are like, yep, Kevin's coming in at eight, crown on 13, uh, DO composite on 12, and, um, and everybody can read it. It's like, this is not helpful. We, we all know how to read and we're all holding a schedule. We're all looking at the same computer screen. So that's not helpful. So what I'm thinking is, as far as a morning huddle goes, is are we starting our day the way we want to start it? What information do we need from each other to, to help us do our job to the best of our ability. Different teams do it in different ways. These are a couple of different teams I've been working with recently. The one on the left you see, it's, they just go down three columns. The assistants have their time in the huddle, the hygienists have their time, the admin has their time, the doctor doesn't even have any time. What you see on the right is a different way to create it. So they've started to create a little agenda, but it was team-centered. What do we need that is critical for our day? And if you actually know that, you can actually come up with something that is very scripted every morning, very flowing. So as you see on the top left-hand corner, this is how the huddle is going to go. This is why we do it. But then how do we do it? Well, we review the previous day. And then the scheduling coordinator has his or her time. And then the clinical assistants have their time. And then the hygienists have their time. And the doctor has their time. And then it's a quick little check-in. For me, um, in my practice, um, this, was, this was my um, uh, morning huddle. It was a deep breath check-in, and then we knew what, the, what we were going to do through the hygiene column, restorative patients, and then a couple of things to check in with today's schedule, some monthly reminders, and then on Tuesdays, we would always look at the statistics from the previous week. Wednesdays, we would look at um, how we're doing per month because we have some goals, and on Thursdays, we would look at sort of openings, and, and that could change. We were agile. This is systems thinking. Um, so for me, this is very individualized, but we have to create it with intention so that we're consistent every day. And when we do that, again, this is what you feel like every day. You feel like, man, we are here together. This is team centered. And we now know what everybody needs to do to do their job to the best of their ability today with what we have. So now let's sort of jump into a couple ones that I think would be fun to work on. Um, and I mean that very sincerely while you're home um, and you can't actually see patients. And this one seems so simple, financial arrangements. Well, sure, we all have them, but are they as clear as they can be? While we're sitting at home right now, why can't we take a step back and refine some of our current systems? Maybe we don't need to create, but we can refine. And that could be just, are, is, it, is it clear? Are my financial arrangements clear? Or is the patient confused? Is my front office confused? Are we all confused as to how people can pay for their treatment when they come in. So for me, is, is it just clearly documented? Are, they, are there clearly documented options for the patient or is it random? And are they identified and discussed prior to scheduling treatment? Those are really just the two things that I want you to think about. And lots of offices will do it very differently, right? For me, I, I'm a big fan of simplifying when possible. So when you look at the one on the left, it's like, here patient, here's our financial arrangements. You really have three options which is gonna work best for you, pick one and sign it at the bottom. Some offices are a little bit different on the right. It's like, you know what, I'm gonna offer a little bit more, make it a little more clear. I don't wanna confuse them, but here they are clearly defined. Patient, pick which one you think is gonna work best for you and sign it at the bottom so we know what's gonna work best for you there. But it needs to be nice and clear. How are they gonna pay for it? When I was um, the director at the, um, at the, in the faculty practice at the dental school, I'm um, using this sort of funky flowchart, OmniGraph is what it is for Max. You can see here that not only did we create it, but now we got to talk about when do we present it to them? When do we want it signed? What does optimal look like? So you see there from the time the patient called to when are we actually giving them the financial policy and when does it need to be signed so that we can move on? We had some clarity, all of us on the team um, in the faculty practice, as to what the financial policies were so we could talk about them, when, who was gonna present it, who was gonna make sure it was signed, and how we were gonna use it. We had some clarity. 
And you can imagine then you're like, well, that's a system. How do we know if it's working? Well, again, as I said earlier, uh, num numbers don't lie, right? So what might you see when this starts going better to track it? Well, certainly you, you may see that in this particular practice, by the way, these are all real practices. So that you see, I, I pulled from a few practices um, that I'm working with right now. So when we start working on um, financial arrangements, what you might see is the, is the AR from zero to 30 go up. Well, that's because in this particular practice, what we realized was we weren't helping the patients overcome the barrier, the financial barrier to doing, we weren't, we weren't doing as much as we could to help them overcome the financial barrier. So when we did that, we would expect the zero to 30 AR to go up because yeah, we're, we're, we're working some things out that are specific to this particular practice, right? But the other thing I want you to see that changed here is that the 61 to 90 started to go down because there was clarity about it. We didn't have things lingering out there forever, wondering where our money was and when it was coming in. So are you clear on that? And it doesn't take a lot of time, but maybe while you're sitting at home, you could think, you know what? Yeah, it, could I refine it a little bit more? Could I dial it in a little bit more? Could it be more clear? And then we're gonna see some statistics reflect that it's going um, really well. As we move on down to this one, this is a big one. This is a beast of behemoth for some people. Oh, my continuing care. Well, again, where do we start? Where do we end? What does it look like? And it seems so overwhelming. We're just like, this is our hygiene department. This is our continuing care. Call it what you will. My first thought is we have to start to think like a business person, right? And the business person would say, well, really what we're talking about here is the patient is saying, just don't lose me. Well, <laughs> Lose who is, my, is always my question. Who are we losing and how many people are getting lost? So you could look at stats, you can start to look at trends. And this is one of my favorites. So who should we be seeing? Well, if we actually have, in this particular practice, 1,419 active patients, then in a perfect world, you would expect to see 237 patients every month because that's, that's a sixth of our, of our total patient base. And if every single person was coming in about twice a year, then we would expect to see 237 people this month. But of course, we know that we've got some SRPs, we've got new patients coming in, there's things that get in the way, but we have to know what that number is. And then we look at how many did we see? Well, awesome, we saw 212. It wasn't everybody, but it was almost 90%. Well, that's pretty great. And so you're like, oh, that must mean your continuing care um, to, uh, flow is doing great but then we have to look at stats. The same practice, as we start to see how things are going, you see the numbers that we're seeing are not so great. We're only seeing about 68% in, in December, we only saw 68% of the patients that we really could have seen. Um, in November, it was 73. In September, it was down to 74. October, it was back up in the 80, but you're thinking, so what's going on with that? Well, this is where I think numbers get fun because what are you curious about right now? What do you wanna know about why those numbers are down? So it might be actually this, when you see a trend that, that looks like we're not seeing all of our patients, like you see that in red there. So these were, were like, man, this is a different practice, obviously. We are not seeing a lot of our patients that we should be seeing. Well, what could you look at? You could look at something that, um, that is called capacity utilization, which is double check. Are your hygienists busy all the time or do they have a lot of open time and you see here that these three hygienists um, I named them because I, 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 um, I took the names out to protect the innocent so I'm um, hygienist healthy and hygienist happy and hygienist genuine those three hygienists actually um, are, are busy almost all the time so they maybe they can't see all those patients are you curious about that do we have the capacity to see the number of patients that we're supposed to be seeing that's something you might look at or you might say to yourself, you know, the other thing that I'm curious about is, are they canceled? How are cancellations going? Are we not seeing all these people because they're scheduled, but then we're canceling on them? Or um, they're canceling, we're not canceling on them. They're canceling on us. And so now we have to track what is our cancellation rate and where might that come from? So we're going to come back to that in just a minute. So when we start to think about our continuing care system, really, it's a little bit more than just our software confirmation. It is, that has to be part of it. 
um, we might have to reach out and connect with some people um, to make sure that they're coming in. But when I talk about cancellation right here, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, why are they canceling? Well, are they canceling because they don't see the value in coming in? They don't have the reason to return. They don't, it's just a cleaning for them. It's no big deal. I can miss it when the sun comes out today in the spring and I have an appointment. If our offices were open, you know what? Nah, I'll go play golf today because the sun came out. But if there's a distinct reason to return, which is a whole system in and of itself, that if we integrate that a little bit more, help the patient see the value coming in, you know what you may end up seeing? You may end up seeing the cancellation rate going down. So, but it's going to help aid our continuing care system, isn't it? So this reason to return is connected to our um, continuing care system. But what if you're doing that and, and then you're still, you're like, man, those numbers still aren't adding up. Everybody's busy, the cancellation rate is down, but we're still not seeing all the patients that it appears we're supposed to see. Well, you know what we forgot to check? Is this number right? Do we actually have that number right? Because if that number is wrong, then the number that we expect to see every month is wrong, and then everything underneath there is skewed. So the cool thing about this is, is we get curious about things and think, how is it all related? And, and what can we work on to connect it all together? Once we know how many patients, um, where our cancellation is, do we have the capacity to see those patients, then we can create something that looks optimal. How do we wanna make sure that we're not missing people? And again, this was from my practice. I show you a lot of mine. Um, so you can sort of see, we had to have a starting point for our continuing care flow. So we thought, oh, the new patient calls. And then we sort of work down to how we just make sure we're not missing them. Who does what? Who's going to do what to make sure that we've captured them, that we're checking on all these statistics and that we're not missing our patients. And once it's clear, you've got something you can now refer back to and make sure that it's going well uh, later on. So that's that's a, a, a quick glimpse of continuing care and so maybe some thoughts for why you're home why we're why we're all being forced home for a while the next one down as you see of the seven is internal marketing i would be remiss if i didn't bring that one up today uh, mostly because um, this is how we get who we want in the practice when we talk about internal marketing as opposed to external marketing we actually have to think to ourselves um, you know who's out there who do we want? Is there enough of them? And what does that look like? And start to live in abundance. Of course there are enough of them, but how do we get who we want in the practice? Well, a lot of different people will do it a lot of different ways. And you might see these bullet points here, just the big bullet points, the phone intake to the welcome to the patient note card to the thank you for referring to the where taking new patients. This would be the minimum for internal marketing, but I want you to see under the phone intake screening and website, is your why. A couple of things underneath there, because when people are looking you up or calling in, if we want more of the people that we, that we want to connect with us, then we have to make sure they know our biggest why, our big, crazy, this is why we exist on this planet Earth why. And if we don't relay that to them, then they're not inspired to come in. And then also, if we don't tell them what to expect, then we have a, this disconnect between expectation versus experience. So once we start looking at what we want to, what are our touch points in, with internal marketing? So this would be a practice. We just got to start writing them down. What are those things that we want to intentionally do to get the right patients into our practice? And how are we going to do those? And it can, look, it can end up looking at a system like this. How do we, where are our touch points with a new patient? Where are our touch points with our specialists? Because we like to get patients from them. And where are our touch points from our existing patients? And when we know those touch points, we can actually track it with something like this. So this was similar to mine. It's got my name on it right now. But really, internal marketing, when you dial it down, it could just be these four departments. How, do we di how are we differentiating ourselves? How are we reinforcing new patients? What are we doing on social media? And then I have this other correspondence. And if we know what those touch points are, and we know exactly what those are, so they are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there are eleven specific things that we're doing for internal marketing. Now, how many do we want to do a month, and who's expected to do them? 
And now we can actually just track it and say, you know what, actually this month out of um, 117 things we thought we were going to do, we got 102 of them, which is an 87%. And if you grew up going to school, if you were me going to school, um, I would always take an 87%. So uh, for me, that's a spectacular grade. For a lot of you on this call, you're used to the 98, 99%. So I don't even know what that feels like. So, um, but at least you can sort of see where you're doing and check back in. Now, if you're doing that, what would you expect to see? You expect to see some changes. You expect to see changes like not just new patients, but how many? Maybe you would have wanted less instead of more because of the type of patients you were getting. In this particular practice, we did want more. But then what did we want more of? You see, we didn't just want more patients. As we worked with our internal marketing flow and system, we thought we want more patient referrals, telling them our what and what to expect. And you see that go up. In the, in the red circle on the right. We also wanted more referrals from our specialist. And you start to see that number go up. And then actually, I would expect to see the advertising referrals to go down because we're doing less of that and more internal. So what you're doing is you're sort of seeing the benefits of the work when you start looking at systems very intentionally. Now, how are we gonna take care of all this? The sixth, what I would say, critical system in the office is your team meeting because so far what we've talked about are things that need some updating that need some refining and actually we need to keep creating these and we need to do this as a team so basically it's like a morning huddle on steroids it's like lots of love and lots of work how do we reconnect with each other and keep these team-centered systems going well the first thing we have to do is create a safe environment connect with one another feel feel like we can be ourselves around each other. And then we can review our current systems. How are they going? We're fine them. We worked on that a few months ago, but what's different? And then create some new systems. What do we need to work on this month? What's our point A to point B this month? And how are we doing? Let's check in. How are we doing with our critical practice statistics? So we've got to come up with an agenda and every team is different. This is a team that, that I was working with and you can see here, we're going, we're answering the seven questions, the what, the why, the who, the when, the where, and then finally the how. The why is always critical. Why are we having a team meeting? If we can't come up with our why, I'm uninspired to have a team meeting. But if I know with this particular team that it was because we want structure, we want clarity, we want efficiency, we want unity, we want knowledge, um, we want a celebration, we want to know our goals, we want to document our practice. Now I'm inspired to figure out what we want our team meeting to look like and how long does that take for us? It's different for everybody. We got to figure out our topics as you see on the right side. How long do we think we need? Who's in charge of that? And then finally, what order do we want that to look like? And we do this for each team very individually. For me, this was my team meeting with my practice. It was a half a day. We decided we wanted a half a day once a month. It was very specific, very transparent, um, so that there were no surprises every month. The agenda goes out a few days ahead of time. So everybody's ready. Everybody's got their thoughts about them. Um, there's, there's no um, blind sides and, and, and we know exactly how they go. In fact, we start to look forward to them every month because we connect and we work on things and it's what we created together. So for me, this is, this is how we start to bring it all together. I saved the last one for last on purpose, A, to see how much time I had left. And because this is something we could start to think about while we're at home and just put some thought to it. You can call it what you want. Today, I called it block scheduling. And really, I'm just going to tell you, just do this. You know, let me just tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you to put this many patients here, this many patients here, and just do it. Um, you know, it's, uh, no, you know that's not the case, right? You can't just do that because everything is different. My question for you is this. How, how do you know how you want your schedule to look like? How much money do you need? How many patients do you need? How much time do you need? And we can't look at our block scheduling until we have some answers to how much money you need, how many patients you need, and how much time you need. Why is that? Because when you look at this as a practice that we're working with, it's like, well, if you look on the left, okay, well, these are the hours we think we all wanna work. Great, these are the hours. But what about how many new patients do we actually want? Because if we're gonna block schedule, we better have space for our new patients. Well, how many do you want? I don't know because how much money do we need to make? You can't have 14 new patients a day because you actually have to do the dentistry. So we have to look at how much 
is enough of everything, which means we get to be the business person. For me, it's actually taking a look at the previous year. Just what did you do? Looking at all the seven categories that I look at in a practice. But then the cool thing is, is if we know that, we can say, well, let, let's define. In fact, let me pull this up big here. So if we know what we did last year, as you see, and, and, and if we said that's how much it's going to take to run the practice, not including the doctor's salary at all, just what did it take to run the practice? Now I'm going to scroll down this real quickly. Now you get to say, you know what I'd like to make, but what's real for you? Let's keep it real. What does it take for you to live your lifestyle, to pay your bills at home, to take your couple of weeks vacation, to eat out a few times a week when there's restaurants? Um, but what's that number for you? And then how much do you need for retirement? You need, a, you need a savings account for your practice for when the air compressor goes bad. So what's that's the solvency account. And then you know what you have to collect, $1.1 million in this practice. That means you would need to collect about um, 99,000 a month. And if you worked 170 hours a year, you have to know that, then you know that you need about 7,000 a day, but then don't forget, if, we, if that means we're gonna produce 1.1 a year, what if you've got what I love these days working with is a hybrid practice. You are taking some, I'm not saying, don't mishear me. I think it's appropriate for a lot of practices today to take some, um, for lack of a better word, benefit companies or insurance companies. And if you are, then you have to know what your write-offs are. And so if you're writing off like 20% on a regular basis, then that means you actually need to collect $239,000, you need to produce that much more, which means that you have to produce 1.4 million so that you can collect 1.19 million, which means that now you actually, your what you need to produce a month is actually 119,000. But if you know that, you see, if you go down that, now you're like, oh, if that's the case, then my hygiene department needs to actually produce 35,974 per month. I, the doctor, have to produce 83,000, which means if I work 170 days, that's about 5,200 bucks. If you know that, bingo, bango, bongo. You now get to say, how many new patients do you need? Where are you gonna put them? Where do you have spots that are, that are connected to those in hygiene? Because we better have spots for those. How much do I need to produce? So you can call them your rock, your sand and water. People do it different ways. This team, we called it that. So now you know how much you have to produce. When do you want to do your, your biggest production? What part of the day do you want to do that on? Because we better get about 80% of your daily production in that chunk of time. And then you got some sand out there. I tend to think an appliance is actually a rock. This practice didn't. Um, but regardless, you now can create something. And now that you know what you need, you can, you can together as a team say, what does optimal look like for you? You can take a schedule and start to draw it out. When do we want our new patients? When are we doing our exams? You can look at it from different columns with different hygiene columns, maybe different days of the week, depending on who's there. That's what this practice did. Two docs are in some days, another doc is in another different day. But now we've got some clarity and you really can start to create what optimal looks like. What things are you actually gonna see when this happens? Well, you will not be surprised, right? You start to see trends. You start to see that the gross production per day, um, the average starts to go up because you did it with intention. You start to see that Dr. Awesome, actually utilization, capacity utilization was 100%. He was utilized all the time, but actually he had less patient visits, but still produced more per patient and more per hour. And because we create it, we get to see, do the numbers reflect it? Because the numbers don't lie. And this is how we start to get into block scheduling a little bit. Because there is always, and I thought today I'd bring this up, there is always a better way. And this book is spectacular. And of course, you, Pete got to sign my book, um, and I think the week after it came out. Because I think there is always a better way. We can always be refining things. And how do we want our patients to come through the office. What is, what is this optimal new patient flow? We can start to create that point A to point B. What's our expectation for our patients and how do we create that with our team? Sooner than later, this was back to the other um, software, you start to see your whole practice from way up here, systems thinking, how one part impacts another part, 
how our continuing care is connected to our specialist referral, is connected to the way we schedule, is connected to the new patient, is connected to financial arrangements. It's all connected and we see that, but it takes time, it takes effort. And I thought, even though I'm pretty much out of time because I wanna take questions, this is one of my favorites that I thought a lot of you would appreciate. If you're doing a lot of in-house appliances, we were struggling with it in my practice. We, we had, man, we were, we were like, what? That appliance isn't ready yet. It's back in the lab. It's on the counter. It's just the shell isn't even made yet. We just took a quick point A to point B and created optimal for a splint flow chart. In this day and age with, with integ integrating airway into the practice, we certainly can have some clarity on how that looks like in the practice. People are struggling so much to integrate it into helping patients be healthy that it's um, that we, we just need to have some clarity and sit down with the team and create optimal and know what that looks like. So there's a lot of different systems. However, the seven that I wanted to talk about today in almost exact, just a little over 46 minutes, 47 minutes, is, is this great mnemonic that you'll now never forget. And that's Pumphakitaba. And that's gonna help you remember at least the seven that I think we could all be working on while we're home. And is it that you wanna create it? Sure. Is that you want to refine it? Great. But remember this much, and this is my only driver part that I'm going to say, you can work on it while you're at home. You can't refine it without your team. And you could do, well, I do so many Zoom calls right now with teams where we're sitting down and doing this from a distance, whole thing with whether you're paying them right now or not paying them on, on unemployment or not. That's, that's tough right now. But we're doing a lot of calls from home because it keeps people hopeful for when we come back. It helps them see something that's going to be different when you come back. It helps keep people engaged and it helps keep you connected as a team. So uh, my hope is that you share a Pumpha Kid Tipa with your team a little bit while you're home. And, uh, and we all go back to work with something a little more refined and, um, and you're excited to implement when you come back. So um, I've never done that exact um, presentation before and we got it in just about 50 minutes which was not so bad and so uh lee why don't you come back in why don't i stop share right now let me do that escape stop share and how's that how why don't we do that for now how's that go that's great i just want to know my question is how long did it take you to practice saying pump <laughs> <laughs> i did it on the spot on the spot i looked at it earlier today i was like that's mnemonic. And I was like, oh, I don't my know God. what it's going to sound like. Like, how did you do that? How did you do that? <laughs> okay, we do have a bunch of questions. Um, so um, Kim asked, um, how long do you um, give your hygienists per patient? How long do you suggest for a hygiene visit? Oh, I love that question. And that, again, is when you sit down. This is a, it's a shame I can't just say always an hour. We had to sit down and say, what does optimal look like for us, right? If we are, what does my exam look like? What does her exam look like? Mine were hers, so I can say her right now. Um, is, is, do we look at, does the hygienist look at, do a quick joint evaluation, muscle evaluation, look at the bite so that when you come in, he or she is transferring that information. What does my exam look like? What do we hope to get out of? So I wish I could tell you, but it's what is appropriate for your practice. Right. And great conversation to have with your hygienist, with your hygiene team, correct? So great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. All right. Yeah. So Fred would like to know, um, do you think a cancellation policy slash fee is important? Is it a real thing or just a way to try to avoid cancellations? Great question. I love that. You can write it. My, now you ask my personal opinions. I'll give it to you. My personal opinion is you can have one. You can write it down. You can have the patient even sign for it. But if they cancel within 24 hours, that's your opportunity to go, you know, I know something came up. I'm going to go ahead and waive it um, because we appreciate you so much. So what do I think, do, have I ever charged anybody? No. Do the practices I work with ever actually bill somebody? N no. Um, I just think that when we, that it becomes less of an issue when we have the upstream parts of the practice going better. That's a downstream solution to a problem we could probably just avoid most of the time. Awesome, all right. Yeah. So then you got um, rave reviews from Philip Gold. Wow, 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 awesome. Um, and then um, Kim asked the question, um, how do you find the data to calculate your cancellation rate and your capacity utilization? Sounds like these data should be analyzed daily. Well, they're tracked daily and it is, and uh, most of the time it's the front office that does it. It's a spreadsheet that initially seems like a, a huge pain in your butt. 
until you start to see the value and until they just start doing it every day and make it easy for them, help them overcome the barrier of putting the data in. And then once they overcome the, they see the value in it and overcome the barrier of putting the data in, it's just a spreadsheet that every day you go in and track it. And it's a very simple spreadsheet. And then you get, and then the data is there for you, just waiting to be used. Awesome. All right. So um, another question from Kim, what do you do if you have an employer and a practice that doesn't like change in quotes, um, tried to make suggestions to better the practice and all have fallen on deaf ears? Mm. Well, you remember the, the pyramid I showed on the first slide, which was the underneath communication was leadership and working on leadership very intentionally and then how we communicate to each other. Um, and, and that's a big question. And, and I think a lot of that actually goes back to uh, team centered systems and having a conversation about what optimal looks like. So that's a big question, Kim, except that I, I'd say on off the cuff right now, it's, it's, um, we have to have a conversation. Are we a team centered? Do we want to create team centered? Do we want to have a conversation of what optimal looks like in the practice? And what does that take? Because that's going to take some change. So it's a, it's sort of a flow of, it's a facilitated conversation, if you will, I guess. Right. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Melvin chimed in with just a recommendation, said um, something he learned from uh, Richard Hunt um, is to suggest doing StrengthsFinder. He just did StrengthsFinder 2.0 with his whole team and it was a game changer. I know game you've changer. done it, Kevin, I've done it. Uh, so yeah, it's game there. Changer. Yeah, a whole different part of the conversation we could have talked about today, which is teams, which is personality styles, strengths, and if they're doing the right thing. Yeah, totally, love it. Right, uh, next one was just asking about seeing the new patient flow chart again. Um, and, uh, so one of the things I will tell you, if you've not, if you've not yet done essentials two, we, um, have you do your own new patient flow chart as an exercise in E2. Um, if you've already taken E2 and you're listening to this, reconnect with your lead faculty from E2 and they can walk you back through the exercise. Um, really, you need to create your own new patient flow chart. I'm going to guess Kevin's yep, going to nope, say. Yep, nope, I don't give mine out. I mean, I do, but I say don't, don't, but here's, here's a, here's a way to think about it. Now do your own always do your own. Exactly. And as a shorthand, what I tell you is right now, start by just tracking what you think your new patient flow looks like now. Actually graph it out. How do people come into your practice? Um, and then once you're back with your team, sit down, see if they agree or disagree. There may be some sneaky ways people get in that you don't know about as the dentist. Um, and then once you have yours written out, now go in and refine it and say, where can we actually create a system instead of it just being, this is how it happens. Um, exactly. Beautiful. Um, and then several people wanted you to know they're only going to be able to pronounce that during happy hour. Cool. Me so. too. <laughs> I, I have one tonight. We'll be talking about it, I'm sure. Uh, awesome. And then um, just a whole bunch of thank yous. Um, and a couple people asked about a copy of the lecture um, or the webinar. Um, just remember, these are all recorded. And um, Dylan will edit these. It takes him usually a couple of hours. Um, if you're on the webinar right now, you'll get an email that has the link to the recorded version on our YouTube channel for the Panky Institute, along with your CE um, certificate. So you can go back and watch it anytime you want to. And after you're back in your offices, you can watch it again with your team if you want to, because it's totally free on YouTube. All right. Um, and uh, OK. Uh, Last question, um, which um, either of us can probably answer, but um, how, how does this work or how does it look differently, Kevin, if your hygienist is working with an assistant? Oh, awesome. Yeah, and, and that is its own flow, right? Um, because oftentimes, so now you get to think about, it's one of my favorites. So if the assistant actually comes in, if you're doing uh, you know, assisted hygiene, if that's what you wanna call it, does the assistant come in and take over when the hygienist moves on to the next patient? If that's what you're talking about, it's the same flow. It's like, who does what? And then how does that information get delivered to the front office? What information did the assistant need from the hygienist to finish that appointment? So it really is a, a fun way to create um, this optimal flow um, if it's hygiene, if it's assisted hygiene. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, I will just, Kevin, say thank you so much for doing this. There's lots and lots of thank yous you can go uh, see all the love in the chat box from everybody. It goes um, both ways. 
Yeah, great, great presentation. Thanks for sharing this yeah. and thanks for giving people lots of stuff to think about.